Thank you very much. It's a, let me say first, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here, to come back to BU. Uh, I've been here, as Michael said, a couple of times before. I've always uh, enjoyed myself. Uh, I would only say one, one thing about your, uh, your very generous uh, introduction, Michael. Uh, as of last July 1, uh, after 15 years, I stepped down from being the master of Branford College. And it was a wonderful experience, but frankly, I have to say I feel like I've been paroled. Uh, it gives me the chance to come up and do things like this uh, every once in a while. So, uh, I do want to speak about Lincoln's second inaugural. Uh, this comes, uh, I should say, uh, is a little piece of advertising. This is in, in anticipation of a book. Uh, it will be a Lincoln anthology with some interpretive, in, interpretive essays that will come out uh, in the spring of 2012 from Yale University Press. So you're getting a little bit of a, uh, an intro to that today. And fortunately, the talk seems to dovetail nicely with the broader themes of this uh, program on uh, political theology. So let me begin. On my arrival in the United States, Alexei de Tocqueville wrote, it was a religious aspect of the country that first struck my eye. Unlike Europe, and in particular France, where religion and democracy were often seen at loggerheads with one another, the two seemed not only peacefully to coexist, but actually to support one another on this side of the Atlantic. This was due in part to the Puritan origins of American democracy. The whole destiny of America was contained in the first Puritan who landed on its shore, Tocqueville said. And like Franklin before him and Weber after, Tocqueville was above all struck by the worldly character of American religion. Puritanism carried the germ of equality, and from this, everything else followed. Despite the formal separation of church and state, Tocqueville could still describe American religion as the first of their political institutions. Tocqueville's analysis of the character of American religion inevitably raises the question of what is sometimes called civil religion, a term that is often uh, used synonymously, although there may be some differences with the term political theology. And by a civil religion, I mean a non-denominational profession of faith based upon certain symbols, rituals, and public practices that bind citizens of a polity together by virtue of their membership. The claims for an American civil religion that is drawn upon Christianity without being specifically Christian has had the effect of either appearing as a glass half empty or a glass half full. From those on the secular side of the famous wall of separation, any talk of civil religion or political theology will appear too strong, an invitation to tribalism and nationalist chauvinism. But for those on the religious side, the talk of civil theology may appear impious. Can or should matters of religion be tacked on to civil affairs, or certainly to lack the theological depth or evangelical fervor of the great revealed faiths? In either case, civil religion has struck readers on both sides of this divide as a construction with little grounding in the reality of either political or life or religious tradition. Yet for all of his astuteness, Tocqueville's model of religion, in fact a rather bland form of Protestant moralism, falls far short of comprehending the single greatest expression of American civil theology. I am referring, of course, to Lincoln's second inaugural address. Indeed, this work surpasses in depth and theological profundity anything that Tocqueville thought possible by an American statesman. Lincoln's speech, I want to suggest to you, is precisely an expression of the kind of profundity that Tocqueville believed to be incompatible with, or impossible even within the soul of modern democracy. The question, now, the question of Lincoln's religion has always remained one of the great paradoxes of his thought. Was he essentially a skeptic and a free thinker? as he was sometimes depicted by both friend and enemy alike? Or was he a man of deep and abiding 
religious conviction, a man for whom religion was a kind of music in his soul, as his wife Mary Todd Lincoln once said? Was he a man who came to symbolize the agonized conscience of American Calvinism, or was he simply a shrewd politician who knew how to use religion to cover his tracks? These are not merely antiquarian questions about whether Lincoln belongs to the secular or religious side of the famous wall of separation. Rather, they help us address Lincoln's most fundamental views on history, human agency, and the role of statecraft. Lincoln's most profound reflections on these themes, as I have suggested, occur in his second inaugural. Here, in more than any other text, he draws out the tension between human actions and intentions on the one side and history and providence on the other. How are we to understand the discrepancy between the two, between our actions and purposes and history's direction and perhaps even God's purposes? Furthermore, how is God or providence to be understood as an all-embracing system of causal necessity, as he sometimes wrote, or rather as a mysterious power dispensing justice and whose ways are not our ways. These questions have long baffled Lincoln's readers. First, a little background to the second inaugural. Lincoln's earliest foray into the genre of civil theology occurred in his speech called The Perpetuation of Our Political Institutions, presented at the, at the Young Men's Lyceum in Springfield, Illinois, in January 1838 long before his appearance on the national political stage. The question confronting Lincoln and his audience was how to reattach the feelings and sentiments of citizens to a form of government once its founding principles had begun to fade from historical memory. <clears throat> Lincoln's solution to that problem, at least in this speech, was to try to turn the Constitution and the rule of law into what he called a political religion. Those were his terms. He called it, we need a political religion. Let reverence for the laws, he declared, become the political religion of the nation. But that kind of religion would surely be something very different from conventional religiosity. Its major support will not be in divine revelation, but rather, Lincoln says, in reason alone. If, he says, in the past the pillars of the temple of liberty were sustained through passion, this today must be replaced with other pillars hewn from the solid quarry of sober reason. Reason, Lincoln concluded, cold, calculating, unimpassioned reason must furnish all the materials for our future support and defense. That, I think, is a truly remarkable statement, uh, something uh, for students of religious history that might sound something closer to what you would read in Tom Paine or some kind of 18th century deist than we would expect from uh, Lincoln. Lincoln doesn't say here how reason could be used as a basis for political theology or political religion, but his differences from conventional forms of religious moralism are evident. When speaking at Gettysburg, however, exactly 25 years after the Lyceum speech, Lincoln set out to provide the American Republic with a new foundation. Rather than dating the founding to the ratification of the Constitution, in 1787, he gave centrality to the Declaration of Independence. Four score and seven years ago is a phrase we all know that is not only a reference to 1776, it is an unequivocal allusion to Psalm 90 that dates the years of our lives at three score years and ten. The Declaration had come, come to appear in his mind to represent America's scripture. Lincoln's reference to the framers as our fathers who brought forth and conceived a nation were clearly intended to remind his listeners of the biblical patriarchs who led the chosen people out of Egypt and into the promised land. The language of conception, birth, 
and new birth runs throughout his brief speech. It is to this nation, he says, that we should now be dedicated. The word dedicate or dedicated is used five times. The words consecrate or consecrated twice, and the word devotion twice. The speech makes no formal recognition of religion, but the vocabulary is deliberately archaic and biblical, and it clearly is intended to provide the scaffolding of a new national rededication. The Gettysburg Address is in some sense the most familiar distillation of Lincoln's political theology. Yet with the ex exception, interestingly, of one of the single reference to this nation under God, there is no specific religion endorsed. The address remains aloof from any specific denominational profession. Lincoln speaks here not so much as a Christian, not even specifically to Christians. His promise of a new birth of freedom once again suggests the biblical image of transformation and redemption. But the goal to be achieved is here said to be a political one. That is not an innocuous change, but it is to state an entire new aim or intention. It is not sufficient any longer, Lincoln told his audience, to fight to preserve the Union, at least the Union as it was, but rather to fight for a new kind of Union forever purged of the stain of slavery and rededicated to the goal of equality. The Gettysburg Address seems in many ways a fitting coda to the Emancipation Proclamation that he had signed into law 11 months before. But what kind of faith, you might ask, or what kind of religion does the Gettysburg Address actually endorse? And to answer that question, I think, it is necessary to turn to the second inaugural. The second inaugural continues but deepens these themes of the Gettysburg Address. Here especially we find Lincoln speaking less as a commander in chief than as a kind of political theologian. While well, Gettysburg made reference to our fathers and addressed the themes of dedication and rebirth, the second inaugural drew in direct inspiration from scripture using a language of sin, guilt, atonement, and redemption. It makes at least four specific references to biblical texts, one to Genesis, two to Matthew, one from Psalms, it also makes several other biblical allusions. It mentions the word God six times, the Almighty once and the Lord once. The speech reads in many ways less like a state address than a modern Sermon on the Mount. <clears throat> Excuse me. Lincoln's second inaugural was given on March the 4th, 1865, and it begins with the words, at this second appearing. It's useful to note that this, that second appearing almost did not appear. Up until the autumn of 1864, Lincoln fully expected to lose his bid for re-election. The decisive victory he had hoped for at Gettysburg had not come to pass, and even his closest confidants expected him to be a one-term president. As late as August of 1864, Lincoln was preparing for a transition of power. Lincoln was not only dogged by his sense of failure as a wartime commander in chief, he was being challenged by members of his own party, even from within his, <coughs> even from within his own cabinet. So you can see things aren't as bad as they could be for President Obama. His, his own Secretary of the Treasury, Salmon P. Chase, had never completely given up his presidential aspirations. Chase and his daughter, Kate, had set up a kind of salon that became something of a center of Washington's social life to rival Mrs. Lincoln's growing unpopularity. Chase remained a constant thorn in Lincoln's side and a rival <clears throat> for political power. But by the end of the summer, things began to change. Sherman's troops in the South had subdued Atlanta, and Admiral Farragut had effectively sealed off Mobile Bay. With Grant's troops pressing Lee from the North from Virginia, the military part of the war finally seemed to be drawing to a close. The result was, of course, a stunning and decisive electoral victory for Lincoln. The morning of Lincoln's second inaugural was also not promising. Washington was drenched with rain and mud, and plans were made to move the ceremonies indoors to the Senate chamber. 
But around 11.45, the rain stopped, the sun came out, and the dignitaries made their way outside. It was the first inaugural carried out before the newly completed dome on the US Capitol building. And among those in attendance at the ceremony were not only the African-American abolitionist leader, Frederick Douglass, but also John Wilkes Booth. Lincoln's speech that day consisted of only 703 words. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, I wish I should have brought a copy of the text to pass out, but I'm going to read parts of it. So even if you haven't read it recently, you'll, it will come, come back to you quickly. The second paragraph of the inaugural concludes, concludes with the short sentence, and the war came. Lincoln here and throughout speaks almost entirely in the passive voice. How did the war come about? Do events just happen? What is the role of individual responsibility for these events? Each side to the conflict, he claims, sought to achieve their ends without war. The South sought to break the Union apart, the North to keep it together. Neither could achieve their end through negotiation, and both found themselves in a situation that neither had exactly intended. The speech as a whole is a reflection, as I've suggested, on the tension between divine providence and human responsibility. The phrase, and the war came, in fact recalls a much earlier statement of Lincoln, his so-called meditation on divine will, written about two years before, which concludes with the phrase, yet the contest proceeds. This was one of Lincoln's private reflections, and not even discovered until after his death, and was named what it was, Meditation on Divine Will, by his private secretary, John Hay. Here, Lincoln reflects on the role of providence in history. And forgive me if I read this passage at a little length. Lincoln wrote in this Meditation on Divine Will, the will of God prevails, he says. In great contests, each party claims to act in accordance with the will of God. Both may be, and one must be wrong. In the present civil war, it is quite possible that God's purpose is something different from the purpose of either party. And yet the human instrumentalities, working just as they do, are of the best adaptation to affect his purpose. I am almost ready to say, Lincoln Coat continues, this is probably true, that God wills this contest and wills that it shall not end. By his mere quiet power, on the minds of the now contestants. He could either have saved or destroyed the Union without a human contest. Yet the contest began. And having begun, he could give the final victory to either side on any day. Yet the contest proceeds. That is a remarkable reflection. You can just imagine Lincoln sitting in the White House you know, in his study, writing something like that. You can also hear in this passage the voice of Lincoln the logician trying to parse God's intentions. Both may be and one must be wrong, he says. God apparently cannot abide contradictory attributes. And at the same time, there is the voice of Lincoln the skeptic. He says, I am almost ready to believe this is probably true. The words almost and probably suggesting a certain distance between himself and the sentiments he is expressing. Far from simply endorsing these views, Lincoln says he is not quite ready to admit the truth of a proposition that he believes to be no more than probable at best. Lincoln's sentence, yet the contest proceeds, is clearly an anticipation of the second inaugurals and the war came. Both texts present the war as the outcome of events that human intention could not and did not control, something that not even the most far-seeing statesman could have, could have directed. Both texts express a profound sense of the limits of reason to discern the causes of war, to understand its purpose, or to predict its outcome. The will of God may prevail, but God's will is inscrutable to the human mind. The language throughout seems almost Augustinian or Pascalian, the inability of reason to penetrate or to make sense of human affairs. But the third and longest paragraph of the second inaugural changes things a little bit. It can be divided into two parts. The first part continues the search for the causes of the conflict. 
and the failure of each side to account for it. The proximate cause of the war, he says, was a, quote, peculiar and powerful interest. That reference is clearly to the slave interest, or the slave power, as it was called. Lincoln seems to place blame or responsibility clearly on that interest or power. All knew, he says, all knew that this interest was somehow the cause of the war. That sentence, by the way, occurs at the precise center of the speech. The fact that this interest is not said to be distributed generally, but rather localized in one part of the Union, seems to ascribe blame or moral responsibility primarily to the South. Now, Lincoln's use of terms like cause and interest seem to give this part of his speech a kind of economistic or even sort of a scientific resonance. There is no action that does not have a cause, and there is no cause that is not determined by some prior interest. Interest was not a morally neutral term for Lincoln. It generally denoted selfishness, a refusal to recognize the rights of others, is when he refers to slavery as the slave interest. And indeed, this search for causes and interests was further bound up with what Lincoln himself once referred to as the doctrine of necessity, to which he says he subscribed as a young man. The power of necessity could be understood as the strength of self-interest in Lincoln's moral psychology, and that was seen by him as, a, as identical to the power of human selfishness. Lincoln's use of this language of causes, interests, and necessity did not imply, as it has sometimes been suggested, a kind of general fatalism in his attitude, much less a sort of political quietism. As a statesman, he was deeply cognizant of the constraints on action. The doctrine of causes and necessity set limits to what can be done and what it was prudent to try to do. So in the second inaugural, he attributes the cause of the war not to human intentions so much, but to the logic of events. Neither party expected for the war, he says, the magnitude or the duration which it has already attained. The war had taken on a life of its own that has even outlasted the cause that gave rise to it. Although Lincoln plames, places blame for the war squarely on those states or in that part of the country where the slave interest was localized, he does not use this, interestingly, as an occasion to moralize or to demonize the South. In fact, his doctrine of necessity did not so much entail an abnegation of moral concepts like blame and responsibility, but it did move the locus of responsibility away from the will of the individual subject to the situation in which subjects were situated. As he reminded his audience in a much earlier speech, I think, he says, I have no prejudice against Southern people. They are just what we would be in their situation. I mean, in other words, his speech seems to suggest don't preach. If you want to change people's behavior, then remove the interest that has been the cause for it. Uh, there's no, again, he's not implying any moral stigma to those on the, on the South or on the slave side of the interest, on the interest. It's just the power of the situation that has made them what they are. And by contrast, he seems to be telling his fellow Northerners, <clears throat> uh, don't think too well of yourselves either. The second part of this lengthy paragraph continues, <clears throat> both read the same Bible and pray to the same God. Lincoln's irony here is obvious, but he goes on to add, it may seem strange that any men should dare to ask a just God's assistance in wringing their bread from the sweat of other men's faces but then adding, let us judge not, that we be not judged. Here we see Lincoln stringing together two biblical verses, the first from Genesis, book three, chapter nine, the second from Matthew, 
Book 7, Chapter 1, Verse 1. The argument from Genesis about wringing one's bread from the sweat of other men's faces actually appears, you'll remember, in the context of God's edict that men shall be condemned to labor as a punishment for eating from the tree of knowledge. In the sweat of thy face they, thou shalt eat bread, uh, the Bible says. But Lincoln revises this passage, interestingly, to mean that no one has the right <clears throat> to deny to another what they have earned through the sweat of their own work. Labor, he implies, becomes the source of property and property rights. Lincoln's justification for property rights here appeals not only to the Bible, but to a philosophical tradition known as natural law. The labor of his body and the work of his hands, we may say, are properly his, said John Locke, who cited similar scriptural evidence to defend his views of property. Natural law language and its appeal to certain rudimentary conditions of justice seem to be at the core of Lincoln's objection to slavery. Slavery is a moral wrong because it, de it deprives people of enjoying the fruits, the honest fruits of their own efforts. But this natural law language, consensual, contractual, Lockean, Whiggish, is at least partially undercut by the verse from Matthew that Lincoln adds to it, let us judge not that we be not judged. This implies that even if natural law and the rights of property have been violated, there is more than enough moral blame to go around. No one is above blame. In Lincoln's substitution of the collective, of the collective pronoun we for the ye of the King James Version, which is the one he would have read, obviously, suggests that God's judgment is not an individual charge, but a collective sin. But Lincoln goes further. He now adds to this, the Almighty has his own purposes, and continues with a passage from Matthew. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh, Lincoln quotes. Lincoln now seems to be giving his Whiggish doctrine of free labor a theological turn. Slavery is not just an interest or a cause. It is not merely an economic violation of someone's rights. It is an offense, as he calls it, and what's more, an offense in the sight of God. So what then are the purposes of the Almighty that Lincoln has raised? Here's one place where, interestingly, he provides a commentary on his own passage within the same speech. If American slavery, and notice he, that's his term, American slavery. He doesn't say Southern slavery. He says American slavery. If American slavery is the offense that comes, and if the war is the woe given to those from that offense, then it follows that war is the justice due to those of both the South and the North. The South for its endorsement of and the North for its acquiescence to the sin of slavery. Well, slavery had been initially presented as an economic violation of natural rights to the fruits of one's own labor. It is now presented as a national sin for which this terrible war has been given as a collective judgment. This certainly seems to be very far from the natural law tradition as that would have been understood by Aquinas, Locke, or Jefferson. When Lincoln affirms the Almighty has its own purposes, the redemptivist note, you can hear the redemptivist note tone in his language. The war and the events leading up to it are not deducible from material interests alone. Shall we, he asks, discern therein any departure from those divine attributes which the believer in a living God always ascribe to him? Does Lincoln believe that question? Note how he seems not exactly to include himself in the circle of believers, but prefers to leave the matter an open question. Lincoln concludes the third paragraph with a wish and a prayer. Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray. 
that the war will reach a speedy resolution. But what he says next is shocking. Rather than placing blame for the war, where he had early on the southern states with their peculiar and powerful interest, he now claims that North and South alike share in the moral guilt. Neither side has clean hands. Lincoln here refuses to distinguish the guilt or innocence of either of the parties. Are all guilty in the eyes of God? But why? Why should all be guilty? Why should North and South be punished alike or punished together? Why should God not distinguish or make some distinction between the two? And Lincoln here appear, answers by appealing from the New Testament to the Old, to Psalm 19. He writes or quotes, yet if God wills that it continue, the war that is, until all the wealth piled by the bondsmen, and this is Lincoln's term, bondsmen, a, a word that I'm not sure he ever used before to describe slavery. He uses this deliberately archaic biblical word, biblical sounding word. Yet if God wills that it continue until all the wealth piled up by the bondsmen's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword. As was said 3,000 years ago, so still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether, apart from Psalm. Lincoln's message here has been widely regarded as in the tradition of the American Jeremiah. Uh, which is really the form in which uh, uh, American civil religion takes shape. A sermon in which moral guilt and backsliding are followed by guilt, atonement, repentance, and redemption. It is the classic form that political theology has taken in American life. The speech, as everyone knows, ends on a note of reconciliation. But Lincoln knew that reconciliation would be neither easy nor forthcoming. His speech was a warning to both sides to avoid the hubris of victory and the bitterness of defeat. Note that there is not a scintilla of triumphalism or vindication in Lincoln's speech. Rather, he uses the occasion to turn it into a teachable moment. The sufferings of the North, as well as those of the South, are both fully deserved. And the speech is an attempt to express why an all-powerful God allows the existence of suffering and evil. Now, in the final paragraph of the inaugural, Lincoln moves from the fiery language of a Jeremiah to the prophetic vision of an Isaiah. He, his call to bind up the nation's wounds, care for the widow and orphan, are an indirect reference to Isaiah's call to seek justice, correct oppression, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. His call for a just and lasting peace among ourselves and all nations similarly recalls Isaiah's utopian image of a world in which nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. These final expressions of hope, famous with malice towards none, with charity for all, are probably the best remembered sentiments of Lincoln's inaugural, yet they are not necessarily the parts that Lincoln himself wanted to have remembered. We know this because the second inaugural was the only one of Lincoln's speeches in which he, for which he provided his own interpretation. In a response to a letter from Thurlow Weed, a Republican operative from Albany, New York, who had written Lincoln complimenting on him on his speech, Lincoln thanked him for his letter and added, I expect it to wear as well, perhaps better than anything I have produced. Nevertheless, he predicted that the speech would not be immediately popular. And he once again turned to the problem of what I've been calling unintended consequences in history. Here is what Lincoln wrote to Weed just days after the inaugural. Men are not flattered, he said, by being shown that there has been a difference of purpose between the Almighty and them. To deny it, however, in this case, is to deny that there is a God governing the world. It is a truth which I thought needed to be told. And as whatever of humiliation there is in it falls most directly on myself, I thought others might afford for me to tell it. What is one to make of that last expression, whatever of humiliation there is in it? Uh, an expression that I've often thought about. 
And why does Lincoln believe that it should fall, as he says, most directly on him? Is the statement an admission that even political leadership is nothing more than an instrument for purposes that even the most far-seeing statesman cannot imagine? If Lincoln really believed that, that he did not control events, or that the war was the consequence of divine necessity, why should he feel humiliation at all? This returns us, the reader, to the question, once again, of moral responsibility. A clue to this enigmatic passage might be found, in fact, in a passage from Hamlet that Lincoln, our most philosophically self-reflective leader, said was his favorite. Lincoln was a lifelong reader of Shakespeare and had been and had both read and seen various performances of Shakespeare's plays. Lincoln had seen James Hackett, a well-known Shakespearean actor of the time, perform Falstaff. And learning of this, Hackett sent the president the gift of a book that he, Hackett, had written on Shakespeare. About a year after the gift was given, Lincoln acknowledged it in a letter. Obviously, he had many other things on his plate than sending letters to actors of the time, but he did get around to acknowledging the gift, noting, quote, that some of Shakespeare's plays I have never read, while others I have gone over perhaps as frequently as any unprofessional reader. And among the plays he lists as his favorites are King Lear, Richard III, Henry VIII, Hamlet, and Macbeth. I think nothing equals Macbeth, he said. And he then tendered the following piece of literary criticism. Unlike you gentlemen of the profession, he said, he's speaking of the acting profession, I think the soliloquy in Hamlet commencing, oh, my offense is rank, surpasses that commencing to be or not to be, but pardon this small attempt at criticism. What does that passage from Hamlet, I won't read you the whole passage, but what does that passage beginning, oh, my offense is rank, reveal? In the Lyceum speech, which I referred to earlier, Lincoln had dealt with the theme of political usurpation and men of the danger of men of towering ambition, clearly thinking of men like Julius Caesar. But near the end of his life, he turned to another play of Shakespeare's for moral guidance. The passage mentioned by Lincoln, Oh, My Offense is Rank, is delivered by Claudius, the usurper, who has murdered his brother to obtain the throne of Denmark. In that scene, Claudius finds himself attempting to pray for forgiveness for his crime, but is unable to do so while enjoying the benefits of the crime. The theme is one of unatoned guilt. It is a case of patricide in the house divided. Lincoln's focus on that Shakespearean passage maybe reveals something important about his purpose in the second inaugural. It is a recognition of the old nostrum that all politics entails dirty hands, that the means necessary to achieve his ends made him, wittingly or not, an accessory to the slaughter. Like Claudius, perhaps, Lincoln was unable simply to enjoy the fruits of his victory because of the means necessary to achieve it. He did not and could not have foreseen the lengths to which he would have to go to achieve the end of slavery. Lincoln, I hasten to add, was not a regicide, and there is no evidence that he ever entertained second thoughts about the rightness of his cause. With firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, he says near the conclusion of his speech. That is not the language uh, of someone who is second guessing themselves. Lincoln's emphasis on divine providence and history never ruled out for him the importance of human agency and moral responsibility. It testifies, in fact, to Lincoln's willingness to accept the onus of responsibility. And if nothing else, the speech remains a chastening reminder of the moral costs of war, even if it's a just war. Thank you very much.